Model Engineering for Beginners, Part 24, Useful Information about Plane Turning. I've had a few communications from various viewers asking me if I would do something about lathe turning for absolute raw beginners. I'll be making a few videos very shortly about simple lathe operations. And this is the first one. Not wishing to confuse anyone, on screen at the moment this is not a lathe, it's a very old metal cutting bandsaw. It's a bit like me really, old but adequate, it cuts the metal ok, I've speeded it up because I don't think my lifespan's long enough to edit a video like this in real time. Initially when I start the plane turning part of this video it will be in real time, but after a while I have to speed it up, as I'm doing at the moment in this bandsaw sequence, which is speeded up 600% just to get through it. What I'm doing at the moment is shortening this billet of steel to a more manageable length. And during the band sewing process, I kept the blade lubricated. And now it's time to go over to my very old and quite small Boxford lathe. I could go out and buy a much bigger lathe. And believe me, I'm sorely tempted because these small lathes, this is 5 inch centre height by the way, are all very well until you come to hold something very large in the chuck. For instance, the lathe that I sold a while back, my smart and brown lathe, would allow a piece of steel like this to go down the spindle. The first part of a lathe operation is usually facing across the front of the piece of work, but with this being quite a large billet of steel and stuck out so far from the chuck, I gave that a miss. After centre drilling the end of the work, I then fitted a live centre. If you haven't got a live centre, go out and buy one. When you buy a lathe, it will probably come with a centre, but it will be a dead centre. It just fits in the tailstock and relies on lubrication to spin in the centre drilled hole in the work. Because a dead centre is much shorter than a live centre, technically speaking, it's more rigid. But in practice, I always find using dead centres to be a pain, because whatever you do, they get very hot indeed. As they get hot, they put more pressure on the centre in the work, and apply more pressure to the bearings, and in turn get even hotter. So if you've just bought yourself a lathe, before you use it, go out and buy a live centre. You've been watching me facing across the front of the work with it supported by the live centre. Now I'm taking a longitudinal cut but the lathe is slowing down and stopping. That's because I slackened off the drive belt which put a lot less pressure on the motor to let it spin freer. Recently I've been having some problems with my three phase converter owing to the fact that I work in a garden shed. And apparently there's a bit of a voltage drop with the long cable that runs up the garden. And this was upsetting the three phase converter and making the boost switch in and out all the time. So this video is going to be a good test as to whether I've really fixed it. If you want to see more details of how I fixed the three phase converter, please watch the video that I made the other day. Back to the job. As you can clearly see, I've applied plenty of oil. Really, I should be applying some coolant or soluble oil, which is an emulsion of oil and water, but I don't like the smell of it. It goes everywhere and I think some of it is very nasty. The lubricating oil that I'm using is the stuff that I normally use for lubricating the bearings of my steam engines. I get it from a company called Hallett Oils and it really is very good stuff. I used to use my own mixture which was 50% steam oil, 25% machine oil and 25% rapeseed oil. But these days I just use Hallett Oils standard lubricating oil. Now it's time to get serious. What I'm doing at the moment is engaging what's called back gear. This lever engages a reduction gear inside the headstock, so now the lathe goes very, very slowly, but it's much more powerful. At the end of the day, it's all down to rigidity. The bigger and more solid your lathe is, the more rigid it's likely to be. Smaller lathes are not very rigid, and they do move about. In fact, the biggest of lathes, relative to the load that it is under, will move. It is, after all, cutting a piece of steel. The tool is carbide, and it's very sharp. But it doesn't matter, some errors will creep into the machining process. I'll give you another example. A friend of mine, who sadly died a few years ago, was a professional photographer. In his photographic studio, he had a massive camera mount. It was built like a tank, it looked like a lathe or a milling machine. It was made largely from cast iron, very, very solid indeed. This was to stop the camera ever moving, so the stability of the photographed image was near perfect. At the moment I'm taking quite a deep cut on this piece of steel and it's a very slow and very boring job. Even my action man's thrown himself off the shelf. 
On top of the shelf that the action man has just thrown himself off is a small model of someone turning on a lathe. My late mother bought me this before she was actually late. And I keep it in the workshop just to remind me of my mother, who I love dearly. Why do I use such a small and old Boxford lathe like this? Why don't I just buy a big proper one and then I can tear the metal off much more quickly than this? Well, the answer's simple. How many people do I know who are beginners and have a massive lathe? Not many. In fact, in my case, I don't think I know anyone who has anything much bigger than a Myford or maybe a Boxford. And as I make tutorials designed largely for beginners, that's why I use a machine of a size often used by beginners. By the way, I do not recommend these Chinese mini lathes. They just scratch away at the surface of the metal and don't do any real work. OK, I suppose if you're a watchmaker, but not so good for this job. Here's a good tip. I use an old shovel in the chip tray, so all the chips fall onto the shovel and then I empty the shovel in the bin. I never can find the time to keep my lathe in pristine condition. Right, back to the job. As you can see, because the lathe is running slow and taking a very deep cut for a lathe of this size, the finish on the work isn't too good. This is known as a roughing cut and the tool itself isn't very sharp. This carbide tip's been in use for quite a while. In this clip I'm disengaging the back gear and putting the lathe back to normal speed. Now I can't take quite so deep a cut, but the finish should start to get better because it's going faster and the cut is not as deep. Here's a really good tip. This lathe tool has done a lot of work, even before I used it for rough cutting this piece of steel. But the other side of the cutting tool has done hardly any work at all. So at this stage it's a good idea to put the lathe's traverse in reverse so that the tool travels away from the chuck instead of towards it and look at the difference. This tool tip has given very good service but now it's blunt. So I turned the tip round to a brand new face. These tips are usually triangular and you get three shots at using them. These carbide tips are great, they work very well and save time. But there's nothing wrong with high speed steel tools you can grind those yourself, you can get really good results with high speed steel, that is until the cutting edge gets dull. You can buy carbide tip tools where the tips are not replaceable, and you can grind this type of tool to the shape that you need. But to do that you need a special grinding wheel known as a green grit wheel. If you try it on an ordinary grinding wheel it just doesn't work. I want this piece of steel to end up one inch in diameter which is considerably less than it was originally. And now hopefully when I get to the end of this cut, which again will take quite a while, it's not in back gear, but it's still a slow process, I should have a piece of bar one inch in diameter. The micrometer confirms that, but is it one inch in diameter all the way along? Yes it is. This lathe is old, but it's very accurate. If I needed a better finish on this, I'd take a very, very fine skim at a high speed, with plenty of lubricant or coolant. Alternatively, I could use some emery cloth followed by some wet or dry sandpaper. Then it would really shine. But for what I'm making at the moment, this finish is more than adequate. And that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.